Today is an awesome day because we're having a special Spanish service right next door and a guest speaker from Tijuana, Mexico. He's, he's preaching. His name is Pepe Zapata. And he and his family are here. And all disciples from the Phoenix Church have driven down. So there's about 40 people meeting in the room next door. And uh, a young man who is a friend of a, a guy who got baptized last fall, whose name was Hudson Yarborough. Well, Hudson brought his friend named um, Abraham, Abraham Acuna. Abraham's getting baptized today after the service. And so turns out Abraham is, is bilingual. He's a Spanish speaker. And so we'll, we'll have a chance to see his baptism at 2.30 for those who are, who are still here. So that's going to be great. Well, the theme today is, of course, Walk with God. That's our theme for the whole year. But the title today is a little on the dark side. We're not going to go right there. Hold on a second. It's called, uh, we're talking about Genesis 34. Genesis 34 is one of those chapters where not much good happens in it. It's, it's kind of a dark picture of human nature. And so we're, we're going to have a, a lot of life lessons from this, this chapter, but we're going to dig right into it. The theme from this chapter is anger. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of sin in this one, but I'm going to just pick anger as the primary focus. It's huge. It's absolutely massive. Now, anger, it can be funny. It can be, you can laugh at it. It, it, it goes all over the place. I, I think about this next video here. For, for those older, you probably recognize this. This is Bobby Knight, uh, the coach for Indiana. This is a classic, classic clip. Okay, we got the video. Okay, so Bobby gets a technical. <laughs> okay, if you're a little league coach or you're coaching your kids, try not to imitate Bobby Knight's example here, okay? <laughs> he's famous for this. This is the scene that made him and kind of defined him as a, he's a, he's a great coach, got a little anger issue. When I was a kid, I... My parents said, listen, if you move this wood pile from way out there into the garage, we'll give you a penny for every log that you move. And it's probably like 50 yards each way, each direction. So I did it and I counted it up one by one, 947 logs, so $9.47. I was probably seven or eight at the time. I was just so proud of myself, so excited. Well, one day I was, my brother was teasing me. I'm going to blame my brother for this. And I just lost it. I just freaked out, had a total conniption fit, was on my back, spinning around, kicked through the door, put a hole in, our, in the door in the rental where we were living. And so my dad says, that's going to cost you $9.47. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lesson in the consequences of anger right there early and, and what my rage can do. It kind of reminds me of this next kid here. So the mother canceled his video game account. You know, we, we can laugh about this. We go, you know, that, that might be a scene from your home right there or whatever. But when it goes beyond this, when it goes into the realm of, of adults, family, it can get dark real fast. It moves beyond the, from the realm of humor to just downright scary. So we're going to get into the chapter here, Genesis chapter 40. 
34, the rape of Dinah. Now Dinah, the daughter Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and raped her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dinah had been defiled, his sons were in the fields with his livestock, so he did nothing about it until they came home. Then Shechem's father, Hamor, went out to talk with Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the fields as soon as they heard what had happened. They were shocked and furious because Shechem had done an outrageous thing in Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, a thing that should not be done. But Hamor said to, to them, My son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourselves. You can settle among us. The land is open to you. Live in it, trade in it, and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and I'll give you whatever you ask. Make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring as great as you like. And I'll pay whatever you ask me. Only give me the young woman as my wife. Okay, so they, they come close to uh, you know, a, a group of Hivites. They, they, remember, they had just fled. They just faced Esau. And so they're coming into the promised land. And they come near this outpost, small town, I'm imagining, 500 or 1,000 people. And Dinah goes and visits. She gets raped. We don't know, Dinah doesn't speak in this account, we don't know, exactly know what was going on, but it's terrible, it's absolutely terrible. When he saw her, he raped her, and it's, it says here that it, he, see, he saw her and then he raped her, and it, it's the same kind of phrasing of the sin in the garden. Remember when uh, Eve saw the apple, she saw it, she saw it was good, and then she took it. And that's exactly the same process that this young man took. He humbled her. And Shechem is a lot like Samson. After he does this, he doesn't discard her, as you would expect. Instead, he tells his dad, get me this girl as my wife, which is very similar to what Samson did with his parents. So at this point, she's defiled, she's outcast, she's unclean. And then, to top it off, the father comes out, Hamor, he doesn't apologize for his son or the behavior. Neither one of them apologize. Instead, it just seems like a business transaction. He says, hey, listen, my, my daughter likes this girl. What's it going to cost, cost us to get her to stay with us? So there's, there's no apologies. There's no admittance of any wrongdoing at this point. So is it bad? Is it vile? Absolutely. Is there anything good in this account? Absolutely not. So it's looking bad, but then it gets worse. So let's keep reading. It goes from rape to massacre. Okay, let's read this section. Because their sister Dinah had been defiled, Jacob's sons replied deceitfully as they spoke to Shechem and his father, Amor. Now, when you see that word deceitfully, you've seen that before. Okay, that's, that's Jacob right there. These, these are Jacob's sons. So they said to them, we can't do such a thing. We can't give our sister to a man who's not circumcised. That'd be a disgrace to us. We will enter into an agreement with you on one condition only, that you become like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you. But if you will not agree to be circumcised, we'll take our sister and go. Their proposals seem good to Hamor and his son Shechem. The young man, who is the most honored of all his father's family, lost no time in doing what they said because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city to speak to the men of their city. These men are friendly toward us, they said. Let's let them live in our land and trade in it. The land has plenty of room for them. We can marry their daughters, and they can marry ours. But the men will, but the men will agree to live with us as one people, only on the condition that our males be circumcised as they themselves are. Won't their livestock, their property, and all their other animals become ours? Let us agree to their terms, and we will settle among us. All the men who went out of the city gate agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem and every male in the city 
was circumcised. Okay, let's just stop right there. And what's going on here? So Dinah's brothers are a lot like Absalom. If you've ever read the story of, of David's son Absalom, very similar. Absalom's got a sister named Tamar. She's raped by his brother. She, he plots revenge. He leaves his dad out of the plot, out of the plan, and he kills the violator. And so what we learn here is these brothers are a lot like their dad in their deceitfulness. Okay, let me just keep reading here. Three days later, while all of them were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brother, brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else of theirs in the city and out in the fields. They carried off all of their wealth, all of their women and children, taking as plunder everything in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you brought trouble on me by making me obnoxious to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are few in number, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they replied, should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? Okay, we learn from this section, Dinah is being held by Shechem. Okay, so... They, they go there, they take Dinah away. She's, she's still there. She's not back with the brothers. And so they strike a deal. All the males in the town have to get circumcised. So the brothers deceive Shechem and Hamor. And then what happens is Shechem and Hamor go back and deceive all the townspeople. All the men who walk out of the city gate, that's like a technical term for all the men of military age, all the men who can defend the city, those who can walk out of the city gate. And they, they don't tell them why they need to get circumcised. They don't share that, hey, listen, you know, Junior here raped Dinah, and so the price of that is everyone's got to get circumcised. Instead, all they do is present to the town the financial benefit of intermarriage with these people. They just kind of gloss over the dirty underpinning of this whole situation. They're like, wow, that sounds really good. All we got to do is get cir circumcised, and then guess what? Our financial prospects are going to improve. They just focused on the finances. So all the men who went out of the city gate, so every man who's a strong man gets circumcised. Then in verse 25 through 26, Simeon and Levi, two of the sons, incapacitate the men, obviously, and attack at a point of maximum vulnerability and weakness. And you wonder how can this happen? Well, it's like Abraham versus the five armies. You know, with his only, he only has 318 men, or Gideon's 300 versus the Midianites. It's like Ulysses getting in and finally beating the, the Trojans by sending in a Trojan horse. It's a total massacre. So these guys go in and kill all the guys. And then the brothers, they don't kill them. The other brothers come in and they just take everything that's there. And the wording there in the, in the phrasing is, they take everything. They kill every, all the guys. They take all the livestock. They take all the wealth. They strip all the bodies. They take everything. It's a total, absolute massacre. So then Jacob rebukes them for endangering the family. He's more concerned about the danger to himself than he is that they did wrong. He doesn't say, hey, what you guys did was wrong. He's like, hey, don't you realize it's going to really cause us a lot of problems? So he's lied most of his life. And he's got a situation where he doesn't have a lot of moral authority in the realm of honesty. When it comes to it, he's got just a very lame, like, hey, this is going to be bad for us. And they basically come back like, hey, should, should she be treated like a prostitute? And then that's the end of it. He doesn't offer any more um, arguments. So Simeon and Levi, they've got the last word in this conversation. So Jacob's silence is essentially a token of acceptance of their behavior. Now, later, Greek and Roman writers praised Simeon and Levi. They said they were champions who, who stood ready to repel such profane and impure ways. Jewish writers compared them to Phineas. Phineas, if you read about that in Numbers chapter 25, during the Exodus, 
he went in and, and stabbed uh, a Jewish man and the woman that he was sleeping with. But are they really? Are these guys really heroes? I want you to think about this. Just step back from the situation. There's a rape of a woman, and two guys come out and say, "Listen, we're not sorry, but we want to make it better. We want to marry her. What's what's the deal?" The brothers say, "Okay, here. All you got to do is get circumcised." They accept it. And then what do they do? They kill everyone in the town, all the guys, and take everything. There's, the rape was bad enough. There's no excusing it. But the brothers felt justified in their anger to go to excess. And it reminds me of this next picture. This is Rwanda in 1994. How many people were around for this when, when you heard about this? Okay. What had happened is there was a minority tribe, the... Uh, not the Tutsis. Yes, the Tutsis were minority. And they, it just this tribal fighting, they killed, ended up killing about 800,000 of the majority tribe, the Hutus. And most of it was done with Chinese-made machetes. It was the cheapest instrument. They ordered thousands of them. And as people congregated in churches and schools for safety, people would go in and literally hack everyone to death. 800,000 people, this is 1994. Next picture. There's, there's a, uh, you can just see just absolute, just a bloody, bloody mess. Why? Anger. The, the president of the country was, was killed in his airplane and then it just sparked revenge, anger, and just absolute demolition of the, the country. That's what happens when anger gets unleashed. It moves from being a humorous story of a coach who just loses his temper to something that just absolutely people are dying right and left. People go to excess. In Exodus chapter 21, it says, eye for an eye. But take a look at what Jesus says about that. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. So Levi and Simeon were like, hey, listen, was it right for that man to treat her like a prostitute? Well, of course it wasn't. But the, the real question is, was it right for them to go in and kill every man who didn't even know what had happened? They didn't ask that question. And when our anger starts to just flare up, all of a sudden we can justify anything. Their anger drove them far beyond the proper response to the crime. This, this theme of revenge and anger, it's popular. I mean, it is super popular. Think about movies. Uh, you know, here's a popular one right here. John Wick 4, okay? Anyone know how many millions this, this, this series has made? A million? Higher? Okay. <laughs> Probably closer to a billion. I mean, Keanu Reeves just revived his whole career on this movie. And what's the whole plot? It's just revenge. Anyone know the, the trigger for him? I think the body count at the end of all four series was if Purnell would know. Purnell watches this for his, his morning pep up. 400? 456? Okay, so John Wick... It's, I mean, if you haven't seen it, he just goes on a killing spree for John Wick 1, another killing spree for John Wick 2, 3, and guess what happens in 4? just keeps on going. And so kills 456 people in a variety of different fashions. Anyone know what the trigger was at the start of the whole series? Someone killed his dog. So the audience is saying, well, those 496 people, they deserved it. You don't kill a dog. Okay, we, we kind of laugh at that. We go, that's nuts. But it's the same concept. Does, does one rape justify killing everyone in town? I go, okay, wait a second. Is that eye for eye? It makes for great movie storytelling. But for living, it's a terrible way to live a person's life. These guys go on to do even more wrong than what's done to them. Destroying family, stealing, pillaging, and looting. So let's, let's bring this down to ourselves. What can we learn? Leave revenge to God. Leave revenge to God. 
Our anger is super hard to regulate. Let's look at this next scripture in Romans chapter 12. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, Simeon and Levi did not read this passage. Okay, what's he saying? He's saying, listen, don't, don't take revenge. That's not your responsibility. He says, leave room for God. Let God handle that. That's not your job. And, but it's, it's our sense of right and wrong. It just goes nuts, doesn't it? It's like, no, I'm going to take care of this. You ever gotten mad at somebody in your car? And they cut you off? Hmm? Oh, yeah. I've seen a lot of women like, oh, yeah, that's me. Okay. Oftentimes, the best thing to do when people hurt us is nothing. Leave it, leave revenge to God. Why? Well, there's so many different reasons. I just want to talk about a few of them. First of all, anger gets passed down. It gets passed down to your kids, big time. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, look at this passage. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. You know what's scary? is that your sin has a tendency to get passed down to your kids. Have you ever seen that with your kids? You see them make some crazy face or some freak out, and you go, that looks really familiar. (laughs) And you go, that kid has absorbed what they've seen in me. It gets passed down. Not not the guilt, but there's a a remnant that gets passed down to our kids. They end up making the same mistakes that we did. Here's a great example of this. Next scripture. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Now this is later in the chapter. This is as Jacob is dying and he's blessing his sons. And here's what he says about these two. He says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce in their fury, so cruel. I'll scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Okay, these two men and the children that they had, they didn't get any property in the promised land as a punishment for their sin. It, it, it had consequences. And that's what happens when we, when we get involved in sin. Guess what? You know who pays the price? Is our kids. Our kids feel it when our sin is, is, especially with anger, pays such a heavy wage. Look at another Levite in this same family. It gets passed down. Okay, I'm not going to read this whole section. I'll just, let me just summarize it. This is Moses. He's a Levite. He comes from the descendants of the Levites. He's a descendant of Levi. And so he becomes a great leader. He's a powerful man. But he's got an Achilles heel. You know what it is? His anger. He's awesome. I mean, Moses, I mean, man, can't get more awesome than that. But guess what his weakness is? His kryptonite. He's got a bad temper. So he's the one that leads the entire nation, defeats Pharaoh, leads them out, leads them to victory, leads them to water, gets them to the border of the promised land. And then the people start arguing with him. They start quarreling with him. And so in verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it'll pour out water. They want water. They're like thirsty, like, you better get us some water, Moses. So God tells them, okay, speak to the rock. So Moses took the staff in the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron, Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? And Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you didn't trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land. What happened? 
Moses was ticked off. He's sick of their whining and their complaining. He just, he has a little fit there. He, re- he grabs that stick, but he forgets what God tells him. What did God say? Did he say, strike the rock? He said, speak to the rock. So Moses just, he, could just, he didn't just like lightly tap it. Like, boom, boom. All the water gushes out. He's like, there. But then God has a little after talk with him. He says, you know what? Because of your anger, your rashness, your rash words, you're not getting into the promised land yourself. Sin gets passed down. Anger gets passed down. Maybe you came from a family where your dad just would lose his temper or your mom would freak out. Guess what? That affects you today, doesn't it? Absolutely affects Anger destroys families. It affects the church. It affects its credibility. Because people look at you at your work and they go, dude, that guy is so grumpy. And you can't talk to him because he just loses his temper so easily. He's just like, like, whoo. Or, or it's, if it's a woman. And don't, don't try to bring up anything to her. She doesn't take it well. What is it? It's anger. You're an angry person. You, one little touch, you just boom, you just explode. It destroys families. I want to ask you, is your wife afraid of you? Some wives are just like, oh, don't, don't get them mad, don't set them off. They're walking on, on eggshells around you because your anger is so unpredictable. Your kids are afraid. Anger destroys families. What's the antidote for anger? Anger gets controlled as a disciple by looking to Jesus and his example. Okay, he's the example. Right? You know, chapter 34 is just a list of what not to do and how not to live. But Jesus says this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Who is Jesus? He's gentle. This, he says, this is one of the only passages in the Bible where Jesus describes his, himself. He says, listen, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am as God. I'm gentle and I'm humble. Aren't you awesome that your God is gentle and humble? He doesn't say, you better watch out because I'm unpredictable and I'm angry. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for yourself. Come, you want to be around people like that, don't you? You want to be around people that are easy to be around, that are they're predictable, that you know that you're not going to set them off surprisingly. Jesus says, that's, that's who I am. I'm loving. I'm gentle. That's why we're going to be going through this book, Gentle and Lowly, in our midweek classes. And if you're not coming on Wednesday, I'd encourage you to come. Because we're going to study out the heart of God, that he's gentle and lowly. And you're going to learn what it means to have a relationship with someone like that. Maybe that's not your current experience in your family, but that's what it's like in the family of God. How did Jesus respond when people spit on him, hit him, taunted him while he was hanging on the cross? They taunted him when he was in his worst worst agony. And they said, hey, why don't you try to come on down from the cross? Now, if that were you, would you be like, ah, no problem. It's okay, I don't care what people think. Wouldn't that make you mad? Wouldn't you just want to be like that little kid in the, the first part of the sermon? Just like losing it? Just like, if I were Jesus, I'd be like, I'm going to just fry all these people. But that's not what he did. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. That's who Jesus is. He left room for God's wrath. He didn't respond in anger. If you have an anger issue, If you have an anger issue, stop making excuses. Stop blaming the people around you. Stop blaming how they're setting you off. Well, if you wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have responded that way. Stop blaming your past. Well, if you knew my upbringing, stop blaming your circumstances. It's time to break the chain. At some point, you got to say, listen, no matter where I came from, no matter what's going on around me, 
I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be an angry person. I will not allow anger to control my life. It's time to become the person God intended you to be. You can be totally different. Your marriage can be different. But you're going to have to get control of your anger and stop seeking revenge. Christy Jones thought her marriage was perfect until the day she received an email from a woman she'd never met. You don't know me, but I'm no longer dating your husband. Okay, that's not how you want an email to start. I'm sorry for any pain I caused your family, the email read. I felt paralyzed, Christy told the, the real, realsimple.com, recalling the exact moment she read those words. Battling her denial, she called her husband at work, and he eventually admitted it was true. Adrian had had a four-month relationship with a woman he'd met at his job as a car salesman. Forgiving him was the hardest thing I've ever done, said Christy, but his honesty made it easier. The two later went on to renew their wedding vows, and Christy said that today our marriage is stronger for it. I have no regrets. There's a person that left room for God's anger. He said, listen, I could totally go nuts here, or else I can forgive. What's it going to be for you? How long are you going to hold on to your anger? It was a cold night in February 2007 when the car holding Chris Williams and his family was hit by a 17-year-old drunk driver. Immediately, Chris checked on his children in the back seat and quickly realized his 11-year-old son and 9-year-old daughter had died. Then as he watched, his pregnant wife sitting next to him exhaled for the last time. Meanwhile, Williams was in so much pain he could barely move his arm to turn off his car's engine. However, before he'd even re been rescued from his car, William told the news he, he had this thought, whoever has done this to us, I forgive them. I don't care what the circumstances were, I forgive them. He proved as good as his word, going on to publicly forgive his family's killer and even developed a relationship with him and his family. Today, Williams is a motivational speaker, sharing his incredible story of healing and forgiveness and inspiring others to extend mercy and forgiveness as well. Is anger and revenge driving your life? It's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. Let me leave you with some next steps. Write a letter forgiving anyone who has done you wrong. Alive or dead, even if your, your dad, he's dead, write him a letter. Just say, hey, Dad, I forgive you. It was terrible. I absolutely forgive you. Give up your right to be angry. It only destroys your life and the people around you. Stop building your case and sharing your grievances with others, sharing all the reasons why you're justified to hurt other people. Let your anger go. And finally, study the Bible about Jesus' love for you. If you really want to change, you're going to need to get to know Jesus. Let's go ahead and close in a prayer, and then we're going to have one final song. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll help us to change, to not allow anger to be the dominant motif of our lives, but instead, God, we will forgive. We'll be like Jesus. We'll, we'll look to you, Father. You, you see all people. You will bring every person to justice. We don't have to play that role. God, help us to live lives of forgiveness, of mercy, and to really look to you, Christ, as our example. I, I really want to pray for those in the audience who are wrestling with anger issues. It's never expressed in church, usually, but it's, it's done behind the scenes. God, I know police, they, domestic violence is the thing that they're the most afraid of, the most dangerous situation of all. And I want to pray for families that right now that are dealing with anger and violence in their home, that you really watch over them and bring healing and change. Help us to grow. Help us to be filled with love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, it's so great to have everyone here today. We've got a baptism at 2.30. And so the testimony is going to be taken next door, but there's going to be a baptism at 2.30. So if you're around, it would be great to have you. If you enjoyed the service today, please just scan that on your, on your camera and leave a review so other people can find church today. Thank you very much.